It's good to have everybody here this morning. The uh, bell has tolled for us. It's good to see everybody here and uh, glad to have everybody that's online watching us on YouTube. Somehow that just sounds strange to me. I don't know. YouTube. But anyway, before we begin, anybody have prayer requests? I know we've got a number that need our prayers, and I know God knows who they are, even though we may not know. And we probably have some on our hearts and our families and among our relations and so forth that could use prayers that we have on our hearts that we can lift up as we are praying. All right, let us go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much. We come to you humbly. And Father, we, we thank you that we have this great avenue of prayer that we can come and, and know, Father, that you are inclining your ear, that you are listening, that you want to hear from us. And Father, as you speak to us through your word, help us to use it and apply it in our lives and, and think of it as, as if that you were speaking directly to us. Father, help us to understand it. Help us to rightly divide it. Help us that we may be able to share it with those around us. And help us that we might have the wisdom and knowledge that we need to interpret. And Father, that we would be more and more like Jesus as he was the living word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to study and to spend time together in edification and singing songs of praise to you and observing the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Father, help us that our hearts and our minds might be centered upon all these things. And we will think of the words that we sing and that we read and that we hear. Father, watch over us, guide us. Forgives our sins and help us always to do better in everything that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me see. Rod. There he is. Okay. I put Rod on the spot just a little bit. He called me this past week and, and uh, encouraged me to carry on with the theme that we're, we're on. I, I didn't know it, but uh, he was working on the same thing. He'll be teaching class after me and said he was working on the same thing. So I hope that I'm not stepping on too much of his material. <laughs> it's full, it's full, yeah, that's for sure. But it's amazing how, how often though that, that we have a tendency to copy each other. I, I may have told you once, but uh, when we were working with the church in Los Angeles, I uh, was supposed to speak Sunday night, preach Sunday night, and the speaker that they had Sunday morning, guess what he was preaching on? The exact same thing I was going to preach on Sunday night. So I had to very quickly turn around and come up with another lesson. I thought, okay. So next time I was going to be speaking again, I thought, okay, I've got a guest speaker. So I'm going to cover two subjects this time. I've got two of them, I, you know, in case he hits one of them. And lo and behold, guess what? He hit both of them. <laughs> so at any rate, you just never know. But, you know... As they say, it's, it's a good thing when we can present the same su subject, and oftentimes it's from a different, perhaps, viewpoint, different perspective, uh, greater knowledge, or whatever. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to Rod's presentation of this also. If you'd like to turn with your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We've been studying the subject of works of, of faith versus works of merit. Works of faith versus works of merit. And this is an important study because oftentimes it's hard for people to differentiate between the two and totally misunderstand which is which. There are those who say that there are things that we interpret or they interpret as works of merit when they are actually works of faith. Like I say, the denominational world says that we say that, that, or at least they say anyway, that, that baptism, for instance, is a work of merit. In other words, you have to be baptized. It is a work. And of course, uh, that, that the scripture teaches us that we are saved through grace and so forth. And if you have to do something, as they say, then it's, it, you know, it causes it to be null and void. Well, as the old saying goes, you know, if, if you were told that, that if you'd walk down to this corner down here, there'd be somebody standing there waiting for you to give you a million dollars. Would you say, oh, oh, wait a minute, you know, that's, that's a long ways down there. That'd be hard work. 
<laughs> you probably out, you know, if, if you had a cane, what would you do with a cane? <laughs> Throw it aside and I'm going. <laughs> or whatever. It wouldn't be considered work at all. Or if we decide, okay, how about going down a couple more blocks? Well, at any rate, I don't want you to be money hungry or anything like that. But the thing is that there are some things that we do that just simply are part of our nature. And that's really how we would probably describe the works of faith. It is our nature. Not that we are trying to gain anything from it, that, that we are trying to be paid for it. Like I say, there are some people who, who simply will not do anything unless they're somehow compensated or rewarded for it. But this morning we're going to be looking at some aspects, especially of the works of faith, and see how they apply. Before we get into this, though, I'd like to ask the question, give me some examples, or maybe it's not a question, but give me some examples that you would consider works of faith as opposed to works of merit that could actually be interpreted as works of, of uh, merit instead of faith. Prayer. Okay, how, how can we look at that as, as basically being a work of merit rather than faith? Okay. Yeah, a lot of times we ask for something expecting God to give it to us. And when God doesn't, what happens? A lot of times we'll say, man, I'll never ask God again. What are we saying? Since... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. In other words, if you know, God does say no, and He says not yet, and we often interpret not yet as no. You know, we're not willing to wait. We're we're an instant society. We want things now. Uh, the old saying goes. You know, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. That's pretty much the philosophy we have a lot of times. And so a lot of times it's easy to take works of faith and turn them into works of merit. We looked at the story of the Pharisee and the publican. He might be considered a very pious, righteous man, religious man. As far as the Pharisee was concerned, he points out he, he'd done all these kind of things, but how did God see him? Well, when it came to the difference between him and the publican, which one did God say did the right thing? The one that was speaking from his heart. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's that way. I, um, as I've mentioned, I, I retired from the Department of Corrections. I oftentimes took inmates to discharge them or take them to halfway houses or whatever. And one guy in particular, of uh, two different faiths, I'll, he, was, he considered himself to be Christian slash Muslim. He says, I can worship at a Christian you know, organization and I can go and worship as a Muslim. And he says, I often pray Christian prayers. I also play, pray Muslim prayers. He says, but he says, I prefer to pray Muslim prayers because I get what I want. Yeah. And so that's actually kind of what happens when we look at works of merit or even works of faith, it can be turned into works of merit. We can be like the Pharisee and say, well, God, I've done this, 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 this. Now what? You owe me. And there are a lot of times in which that once a uh, baptized young man that, that soon after his baptism, I, I got a call from him. He says, I don't understand. He says, I become a Christian. I've been baptized and so forth. But why do I still have problems? question is, for what reason were you baptized? 
Think about it. If, if all we had to do to get away from our problems was to be, become a Christian, to be baptized, how many people would be coming and being baptized for what? To get away from their problems. And there are a number of the television preachers who say that, hey, becoming a Christian, you will become wealthy. Um, Okay, yeah, that's right out here between El Reno and Yukon. Yeah, Jesus answered all, you know, I, it's kind of hard sometimes to appreciate some of these billboards you see because I think that the intent is, is correct, but depending on how people see that or look at it, you know, it can be totally interpreted the wrong way. So, at any rate, like I said, I want to look a little bit deeper into the idea of works of faith versus works of merit. Let's take a look. Uh, you probably have already opened to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 19. We'll go from there down to verse 23. He says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Okay, Paul is writing to the Romans. And what's the problem he's dealing with? Verse 19, the first part of that says, I am speaking in human terms. Why? Because the weakness of New American Standard says your flesh. In other words, they are fleshly people. And as a result of that, when you see everything in the context of the physical, the fleshly, and so forth, what does it do to the spiritual side? What does it do to the faith? What does it do to grace? Well, it destroys it. It distorts it, resulting that, the end of verse 19, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you de derive your benefit, resulting yeah, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. Verse 23, we've probably got that written down, one of those verses we memorized. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, we, we discussed how that meritorious works work kind of like wages. How do we get wages? We work for them. Yeah. When you, when you go to your job five days or whatever a week and, and, and you know, at the end of a pay period, you expect a paycheck. You expect a wage. You expect meritorious, uh, some sort of, a, of an award. Now, here's the interesting thing. He says, for the wages of sin is death. If we earn a wage, what does he say? What does that, what, what does that mean by the wages of sin? Yeah, we've earned it. You've earned the wages of sin. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever seen people do bad things, and then when bad things happen to them, you think they got exactly what they deserve? And sometimes, you, you're, you know, the Bible says we're not supposed to, but sometimes you're happy about it. <laughs> Uh, one Sunday morning, we were coming to church, and this guy flew. He had to be doing at least 90 miles an hour flying by us. 
I mean, it's one of those where he's going so fast that when he goes by you, there's a percussion of winds. And we got down here, I believe it was a, uh, I forget which exit it was, uh, but at any rate, and guess what? Yeah, he'd been pulled over. See those lights flashing and stuff. As we went by, we thought, <laughs> he got what he deserved. <laughs> exactly, he got the wages of his sin. But it's hard to think in terms of, hey, we earn it. We earn sin. That's why that we find, of course, in Hebrews chapter 10 that it says, for those who go on sinning willfully, the idea is in, that it's endurative. It keeps on going. Not that you, so many people have, have read that and, and maybe even been taught or thought they were taught that, you know, after you've been baptized, hey, your sin's washed away. If you sin one more time, you're lost. No, that isn't what that says. Yes, sir. If you exceed the speed limit willfully, is that a sin? Any other questions? We talk about willful. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I've, I've always, you know, understood that the speed limit signs are a suggestion. Tom? Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Tom says that one of the elders that you know he he interpreted that as as being okay. If you're willing to pay the price of a ticket, then you know it's not a sin to speed. To speed, is that right? Something like that. Um, and I also, you know, there. We, we have a tendency to, to say, well, we, we can justify speeding because if you don't keep up with the traffic, which the traffic is going how fast? Some places, if you're not going at least five or 10 miles over speed limit, you're gonna get run over. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's what it is, is rationalization. Uh, and, and on the other hand, if someone is going five or ten mile, miles an hour under speed limit, and you come up on them, how do you feel? Yeah, I, I remember when the interstate had a had a you know maximum speed limit and a nighttime speed limit. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm telling myself, but at any rate. All right, so the wages of sin is death. And of course, you could almost interpret that as being physical and spiritual death. Because there is sin, oftentimes, that does lead to physical death. Right? But what's worse is spiritual death. And a death means separation. Spiritual death, of course, especially means separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our, or yeah, in Christ Jesus our Lord. A free gift. Free. Doesn't, you know, when you get a, when you get a gift, one of the problems we have is sometimes when we get a gift from someone, what do we think we need to do? It's reciprocate. 
Okay, I got a birthday gift from them this year. That means next year or the next time their Bible, their birthday comes up, I got to get something for them. I remember when I was, uh, you know, a, a kid, uh, pretty young, not too long ago, but but at any rate, uh, I remember when my, my brother-in-law gave me $3 for my birthday. First time you ever done that. But I felt obliged then when his birthday came around, what? I gave him $3 for his birthday. And it can go on and on and on that way. It's hard to understand God's free gifts. When the children of Israel entered in, or before they entered in the land of Canaan, what did God tell them about the Canaan, about the land? Did he say they were going to have to work for it? No. He says, I will give it to you. I will give it to you. And he said they would not have to fight for it. It was free. But did they accept it that way? Oh, well, you know, they, even though God said he's going to give it to us, when they sent the spies in, what did the spies do? Came back and they said, oh, we can't do this. There's giants in the land. Even though God said he's going to give it to them. And of course, after they finally did, after that generation of people fell away, when they finally did enter the land of Canaan, and they did what God told them to at Jericho, what happened? He gave them the city without firing a shot, shall we say. On the other hand, then they came to Ai. And how did they feel about Ai? What did they think? How big of a city was Ai? It was a little city compared to Jericho. <laughs> we can go in and take it, no problem. Didn't even send the full army. And what happened? They came out like bees and chased them. Well, they didn't go along with what God told them, that he would give it to them if they would obey his voice. So, here we have the free gift that God gives us. It is free. And there should, I suppose, be some sort of gratitude in which that, you know, when someone does something or gives us something, we should have some sort of gratitude for it, shouldn't we? <laughs> Little kids are great about unwrapping presents, whether it be pre birthdays or Christmas. They get more excited about unwrapping the present than they do the gift itself. Have you ever seen that? Man, they're going through and they're tearing it apart and ripping it apart and everything. And, oh, give me another one. <laughs> and you say, oh, why did I get that for them? <laughs> but that's, that's kind of the way we are as adults. We don't appreciate oftentimes the things that are done for us or given to us. And especially when it comes to God. How have we been blessed by God in such a way that would fill us full of gratitude? that would cause us to want to serve him, to do things not out of merit or earning anything or gaining a wage, but just simply because of what he's done for us. I suppose that's where we come into works of faith. It isn't what we can do for God of what he has done for us. It isn't what we can do for God, it's what he has done for us that should motivate us. Let's turn to the fifth chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 5. Let's take a look at verses 1 through 8. 
He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that our tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Stop there for just a moment. Basically, what this is saying is that we need to be mindful and thankful for everything that comes our way in, in Christ and in God. He says, even in tribulation, you know, in James chapter 1, it tells us that we should count it all joy when we encounter various trials. Why? Because it builds character. I don't go into the whole thing, but basically it builds character. We've just come out of the pandemic. Well, sort of. It still keeps coming, various what, variations or whatever. But one of the things that we find is that if we don't encounter germs, viruses, whatever, what happens to our bodies? We have what we call an immune system. And sometimes they can tweak it with medicines and things like that. But if we are never subject to any kind of sickness or illness, now there are some people it seems kind of weird that they just simply don't catch things. But for most of us, if we don't get sick from time to time, we do not build immunities to the viruses or whatever. When the Europeans came to the United States, what did they bring with them? Measles, viruses, and so forth. What did that do to the native population? Destroyed them. If we go to another country, to a foreign country, what oftentimes do we have to do before we go? Get vaccinations. As Christians, if we're not subject to the tribulations of life, to adversity and so forth. What happens when we do encounter them? We don't know how to handle it. We can't. And I believe that's part of why we're here on this earth. We'll go into that sometime maybe down the road. But the thing is that he's pointed out that Verse 5 says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When you first started dating, your husband, your wife, or even just before you got married, you know, somebody else, okay? All right, guys or girls, uh, you did date someone else be no. <laughs> besides your husband or your wife. But what motivated you to do things that you would not normally do when you're dating? It's that love factor, that attraction factor. I don't know what you think about Bill Cosby. I, anyway, I, I always remember talking about, you know, when he got married, he says, he says, you know, before we got married, man, my wife was doing this and this and this and this and this. And then after we got married, she says, I've got you now, sucker. <laughs> you remember those good times you used to have going out with the guys, going bowling and stuff? Forget it. Well, anyway, that's kind of the way it was. Okay. Grace.
Exactly. I don't know if he was lonely. I don't know what the motivation was. Okay. But for some reason or another, he wanted to hook up. That's the love for him. There you go. Free will. Makes a choice whether we love him. There you go. Well, you've already wrecked my lesson, the next lesson I was coming up with, but that's all right. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's talking. <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, you know, as he says there, there's, why would God love us so much to, to, to make us, knowing what the character of man would be? I, I was reading one of the Psalms this morning in my little devotional that, that, that talks about idols, he says, why, why do they worship idols? They can't see, they can't hear, they can't taste, you know, but yet they cover them with gold and say, we'll fall down and worship you. Or, you know, guide us anyway. It doesn't make sense. That's part of God being a jealous God. But, but yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, Lord willing, Next week, I think, is Eastern European Missions. Brother Tucker, I think it is, going to be here, so he'll be speaking to you. Uh, the week after that, um, I think I've got it again. And uh, anyway, somewhere down the road, Rod's going to be, going to be teaching class. But that's one of the things we're going to try and cover next time. Why did God make us? And, and, and it's all about grace. You know, there are concepts of grace, even though we don't see the word in a verse or chapter, the concept of grace is there, which is what? God's unmerited favor, the things that he could do or whatever that he doesn't do, doing the things that we need rather than what we deserve. But at any rate, we'll be looking at that. Okay. Um, so verse 6 of Romans chapter 5, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. There was nothing we could do to alleviate sin. to Take away the consequences of sin. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. The worst of sinners in this world, did Christ die for them? Yes. When it says, for God so loved the, just the righteous, just the good, just, just those who deserve it, Right? For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever choice believes in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal or everlasting life. Christ died for the whole world. But it's the world's choice to take advantage of it. But it says that all comes out of what? Demonstrates his own love toward us. God demonstrates his love toward us to woo us to him. To woo us to him. Not to make us come to him. And that's what love is all about. There are lots of reasons that we can do or perform the works of faith, non-meritorious works. This is one of them because of God's love that he has demonstrated towards us. And that while we were still helpless, hopeless, sinful, he died for us. In other words, it wasn't that we merited it. It wasn't that we were so good. It's because of his love toward us. Some other scriptures we can look at. As a result of that, of course, let's take a look at Romans chapter 12. Actually, it's back at verse uh, 33 of chapter 11. It says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord who has become, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? In other words, the idea is what, what can we do to put God in our debt? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. As a result of that, he says, I urge you, therefore. Therefore means what? There you go, because of what he just said previously. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Because of what God has done for us, we present our bodies. In contrast to the sacrifice of the old covenant, the sacrifice of the new covenant is what? Us. Me. There's a story told about a, a man who decided he's going to become a Christian. And he says, I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't know what I can give to God. An angel comes along and says, okay, you want to follow God, you've got to give it, give everything. He says, okay, well, in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my dog. I'll give you my truck. And the angel says, okay, that's good. What else you got? He says, well, I'll... Hey, you're getting, you want a lot, don't you? He says, okay, I'll, I'll give my house, I'll give all my possessions. He says, okay, that's good. What else you got? He says, the only thing I've got left, left is my family. I'll give you my, my kids. Okay, that's good. What else you got? Man. My wife? That's good. What else you got? So the only thing I've got left is me. Is that's enough. Everything. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul said, I buffet my body daily. To put it in, his, in subjection. Philippians chapter 1, one of the prison letters that he wrote. I can get there. Verse 1. He said, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. How did Paul describe him and Timothy? Bondservant. What's a bondservant? Okay. Usually the, the servant, but in this case, usually it meant that, that um, they presented themselves to the master for life. And when they did this, and when they became a bondservant, it meant that, that everything they had, everything they are, is the master's. They give up all rights that they might claim. They give up everything to serve the master. There you go. But it's, the, it's their choice. What did Paul say about his, everything that he had? He says, I count it all loss. I count it all as rubbish in order to do what? Gain Christ. Left everything behind. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sure.
Okay. In other words, you're, they do good with a motive. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah. There are a lot of people who do good, but like say it's because they've got an ulterior motive. Okay. There you go. That's the key. It's, it is, you do it sometimes, and people may accuse you of doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah, to gain, with an ulterior motive. But on the other hand, you are actually doing it, and of course the one who knows, you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it simply because that's what you should do. It's out of love, doing what is best for that person. Yeah, good point. And, and so, uh, like I say, here Paul talks about himself being a bond servant. He gave up everything to gain Christ. Um, let's take a look at a couple more scriptures. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. We're running out of time. First Peter 1. Yeah, verse 17. It says, And if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the, pure, to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Fervently love one another, what? With pure motives from the heart. This plan of God, as it says in verse 20, was planned out, was as we were discussing. Why did God make us? It says, for he was foreknown before the what? Foundation of the world. That's what the New American Standard says. How far back does that go? Before creation, God has had a plan. And he says that we were purchased not with silver and gold, but what? Which is far more valuable. One of my favorite sayings is, we do not get our value by what people think of us, but by the price that was paid for us. We say it again, we do not get our value from what people think of us, but by the price that was paid for us. That's what he's saying. Then let's take a look over at the second chapter. Chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Or coming again in judgment. I've got a little footnote there. So what is he saying? This concept is the same concept he gave the children of Israel before they entered the land of Canaan. 
He says, as long as you obey my voice and keep my commandments, you shall be my chosen people. This is brought forward to whom? Well, Paul, Peter's writing to the churches of Asia, but who does it encompass? Anybody in Christ. He says, you once what? We're not a people, now you are what? The people of God. He says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. What does that mean? God has put us where? He's put us on a pedestal. He thinks far highly, more highly of us than we do of ourselves. With that in mind, is it easier to serve in faith rather than merit? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. It says, he has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have the same idea in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Where he delivers from the domain of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We're out of darkness. We're in light. And if, if you dare to say, perhaps, I think what he is saying here in, in the second chapter of Peter, he says, you've been saved to save. Because of your salvation through the blood, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you now in turn try to save others. Isn't that what the Great Commission is about, Bob? Right. And in reality, responsibility. Right. It is a struggle. You know, as I'm as I'm teaching, how many fingers are pointing back at me? It is a struggle. It's constant. But I believe what, I guess what I'm trying to do this morning and, and so forth is to give us motivating factors. What motivates us to love God? What motivates us to perform acts of faith and not do things out of desire to gain, shall we say? Right. It is. It is. And, and that's, that's the difficult thing. Um, <laughs> one of my teachers, Bible teachers, says, he says, you know, to pit mother against uh, daughter-in-law and so forth. He says, he didn't have to do that. That's already going on. <laughs> the thing is, when it comes down to loving and following God as not, you know, there are some some countries, some religion, so forth, that if one of their members becomes a Christian, what happens when they go back? They're disowned, criticized, ridiculed, and in some extreme cases, what? Killed. Go ahead. You know our Uh-huh. <laughs> and what we know about God. Now, if we don't learn about God, then we probably will never accept God as our God. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's... So we have to learn. And the way we do that is through other people and through the Scripture. Okay. We've got to learn the nature of God. We've got to know what God is truly like as a heavenly father. Um, and, and, and that is where so many people, you know, go wrong is that if you ask somebody, okay, describe God to me. 
John, 1 John 4, 7, 8 what, says what? God is love. Not knows love. It, he is the epitome of love. Thank you so much. We didn't get quite as far as I was hoping, but at any rate, maybe we'll pick up a little bit more next time. Thanks for your attention.